Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Bite Size Balance. I am so delighted today to have a really, really special person um, here. I have Jardine Lee Bear with me today. Jardine is the co-author of this book that really was one of my absolute favorites of this year. And uh, I think some of you guys know this, I read constantly um, and I read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of nonfiction. This is, this is really right up there with one of my favorites from last year. And the book is called The Sober Lush, A Hedonist's Guide to Living a Decadent, Adventurous, Soulful Life, Alcohol Free. Um, so welcome Jardine. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you are so gracious to come on this podcast. I so appreciate it. I think this is going to be such an amazing conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Let me, let me tell people a little bit about you, Jardine. So um, Jardine is incredibly accomplished, by the way. So this is a very short, this is a very short bio, um, but it is, uh, it's got a lot packed into it. So Jardine is a novelist. Her novels include Here Kitty Kitty and White Fur, and uh, Jardine's also a screenwriter. Um, the film she co-wrote called Endings Beginnings with director Drake Doremus stars Shailene Woodley, whose character has just given up alcohol. As I said, she's also the author of one of my favorite books from this year, The Sober Lush, um, which she wrote with her friend, Amanda Eyre Ward. And Jardine is from New York. She spent a blissful decade in Austin where she facilitated the Truth Be Told storytelling program in the women's prison there. And um, she now lives in Joshua Tree. Jardine has been sober since January 8th, 2013, and you can find out more about Jardine at Jardine Liebert Projects and The Sober Lush on Instagram and also at jardineliebert.com. So, <clears throat> hello again. <laughs> that bio? I'm excited to see that movie. I haven't seen that movie. I had no idea that it had anything to do with sobriety. Yeah, and it was interesting because the director had an idea in mind and he let me build that character's backstory in and I think it's such a underexplored um, territory in film and tv like not the huge breakdown not the the rehab story but just the simple daily struggle that a lot of women go through with with their yeah. drinking and partying and um, so it was exciting to get to kind of build that into her her world and her character. Yeah, I love that. I've had a lot of conversations about just the, you know, the representation of alcohol culture in Hollywood and women in particular. And I think it's so great. I'm starting to see more often now um, women in roles that don't involve heavy drinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's portrayed as, you know, 100% doable and you can still like look banging and have a really <laughs> life. <laughs> Zero repercussions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can start with your alcohol story, um, Jardine, because I don't know very much about that. I know now you've been sober since 2013. How did you how did you get to be alcohol free? So I I had a pretty much alcohol free adolescence, which is very uncommon, but I'm glad I did because I saw that I could connect with people. I could be super creative. I was already obsessed with writing as a teenager. Um, and I could have like a good big life. Like I was a happy teen. Um, and I really just wasn't, I wasn't around drugs or alcohol. So I was though really super shy. And the minute I got to college, I went from like zero to 180. Um, because for me, all my social anxiety and shyness, I could just sort of zap it away by drinking. Um, so pretty much from the very beginning for me, it was problematic and continued to be for decades. Um, I thought of myself as just like a party monster kind of person. I never missed work. I was never late, um, never late for a deadline, but I was shredded all the time. I was just half a person and like kind of limping through life thinking because I got a lot of messages from the world I was living in that that was normal that right. we're always hung over that actually means that you're living a 
big, crazy life. Um, I thought it was totally okay to, to be getting in my way like that. Um, but I started to get an inklings in my late twenties that I probably should start looking into sobriety. I knew nobody that was sober. It was a dirty word, like nobody brought it up. If anybody had a friend who had a friend who was sober, we usually kind of, honestly, were very um, exclusive about our social world and didn't really allow for anyone who wasn't engaged in that code of drinking heavily to, to belong. So it took me a really long time to find sober partners and to figure out what a sober life could look like. I did little experiments, 30 days here and there. Um, I'm the kind of person that I dreamed of moderating, but I really just couldn't ever do it. So I'm one of- You and like those, all of us. <laughs> I, you know, and I, 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 I have friends who really can have a half a glass and put it down and it's not a big deal to them. I just was never that person. So finally, by 2013, I was able to make this huge leap and just say goodbye. And it was real for me at, at other points in my life. I kind of tried it, but still clung to this dream, like do a year sober and then you can go back to <laughs> to drinking and you'll reset and this and that. And for me, that just wasn't it. So giving it up entirely and taking it out of my, out of my hamster wheel was the, was the beautiful part. Yeah. And um, so as you've been sober for eight years now about? Yeah, I just celebrated my eight years. Yeah. And um, that's my favorite number. So it feels like Amidst the context of everything we're going through, I decided that this will be a lucky year. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, I'm, we're going to talk about the book, but before we get into the book, because I feel like I'm going to get into it and then I'm not going to be able to get out of it. Um, so before we get into the book, um, what, what were some of the, unex I mean, a lot of the people listening to this podcast, Jardine, are thinking about their relationship with alcohol. And I think that that's just a common theme. I've been talking about it a lot this month on the podcast. I think it's a, just a generally growing theme for women right now because of the pandemic. So, you know, people are bored and they're, they're anxious and stressed out. Um, and that is leading to increased drinking. And so people are thinking about that. And um, we're going to talk a lot about all of these unexpected pleasures and joys, I think, that are available. And that's really what the book does such a beautiful job of um, articulating and demonstrating for all of us. But when you, when you stopped drinking, what were some of the surprising, what was the surprising upside for you? Besides like the obvious no hangovers and all of that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I, I had, I think I had so much trouble staying sober, even though I would do these experiments because I kept making it about the alcohol and really what I, what I needed to do and what has ended up giving me so much joy and freedom and soulful stamina, like all these different kinds of pockets of energy I never expected was rethinking my whole life. So it was it wasn't just about giving up alcohol. When I tried to do it that way, like you're going to do everything the same way. You're just not going to drink. Right. I ran into a brick wall. I mean, for the first 10 days or something, I would be exhilarated by not being hungover, but that just didn't last. Like there had to be a different way of going into every day and every night, thinking a different way, rewarding myself a different way, connecting with other people a different way seeing my work a different way, finding meaning in my daily life a different way, not to sound overwhelming, but I really did have to um, rethink what I want. Like, what do you want from the average hour, from the average afternoon, from the average dinner? Yeah. Um, and, and it didn't turn out to have anything to do with alcohol whatsoever. That was just the kind of place marker that I'd been taught showed me this is what relaxation is. This is how you end your work day and start your evening. This is how you ritually sit down and bond with another person. Um, so the joy was realizing that I just didn't need it. Um, and, and kind of doubling down on what I do need and want, being much clearer for the first time in my life about what all those things are and what they look like and how to get them, how to share them, how to give them. Um, 
Yeah, I love that so much. One of my favorite ch little chapters, I, I can't help it, I'm going to go into the book, but one of my favorite little chapters, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one where you talk about like just sending postcards and love notes and like just giving people like the joy that comes from just letting people know they're special and you're thinking about them and um yeah anyway i'd love i loved that it made me think i actually sent i actually sent notes when i read i read that chat. oh that makes me so happy well it's funny because it's funny because i think that might have um a little piece in it about valentine's day which is obviously on the horizon and i was single for a lot of my life and and um a lot of my valentine's days were the most destructive you know drinking benders that you could imagine and that was a huge um, piece of the mosaic for me was realizing that I can be very passive and waiting for things to happen to me and being upset when they didn't and drinking it away and 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 switching that and deciding that a huge part of what my life is now is what can I send out there what can I give how can I initiate things and just I don't know, like you said, just send little notes out to the world, literal or figurative, um, yeah. was helpful to not feel so like passive and what am I going to get and who's going to give me what Yeah, was good and a that. huge piece of this. Yeah. Was that kind of, I'm just curious because I feel like the Sober Lush is just like a collection of, this is going to sound corny, but it's kind of like a collection of those notes that you know that you did, that you did send out because I know I've talked to so many of my clients who've read the book and just so just, I just, I just know from the feedback that you've gotten from that book that everybody else felt the same way I did when they read it, which was like, I, and there's, you know, there's so many ways that you do that so well in this book, but were you thinking that at all when you, when you conceptualized this book? I think so. I think, you know, the idea of, um, I love the sharing model, like that, program in the prison that I worked with for a while is based on that. And I mean, a lot of 12 step is based on that. And I'm not a 12 step disciple, but the idea that our, our stories sh shared can heal each other and give each other a little bit of love. And even when our stories are contradictory, you know, it's not about creating a like-minded new code of things. It's literally just about like sharing anecdotes um, it's obviously what I do for a living too. So I believe in it deeply that it is one of the purest things we can offer the world and give to each other as story. Um, not to preach or prescribe, but just to share. Uh, and I think that's why Amanda and I, because she's a novelist too. So we come from creative writing world. We thought, you know, we found all of this kind of bountiful um, territory on the other side of sobriety, on the other side of drinking in sobriety, how can we share it in a way that um, feels like giving something? And so to package it as creative writing, um, visual writing, sensory writing felt natural to us. Yeah, well, you guys nailed it. It's it's awesome. It's, oh, thank you. It's for anybody who hasn't read the book, and there will be lots of people who haven't who ha listening who haven't read it. I encourage you to get this book. It's so great. And I also, as I was saying to Jardine before we started recording, when I read this book, I was thinking to myself, this book is for everybody. It's not just for people who have stopped drinking or are thinking about stopping drinking or you know who are dabbling and not drinking. It's for it's for anybody who feels like life is just passing them by. They're caught in the hamster wheel. They're, you know, they're um, they're just trying to get through the days, which is so many of the women that I work with around burnout. And I think it's such a common way for women to feel these days. And I was reading this book and I was thinking, this is all about all the stuff that I try so hard to articulate as a coach. And I do a crappy job of it compared to Jardine and Amanda. Oh, I doubt that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, it's perfect because it, it, all of the little things that you focus on in each of the little um, essays or chapters in this book are really are the little things. And what I love about that is that those things are available for everybody. They don't cost a lot of money. They're not um, inaccessible as a result of circumstance. Like they're the types of things that are actually available to all of us every day. And I always say, you know, that definition of happiness is kind of a waste of time as far as I'm concerned, because it doesn't mean anything to anybody when people say, I want to be happier, or, I want to be happy. But joy is a word that everybody understands. And it has this real visceral meaning to it, I think. And 
I have always said that the best way to think about happiness, if that's what you're striving for, is to start working on stringing together more moments of joy, like more of these short bursts of joy. And this book to me was just like a burst after burst after burst after burst. <laughs> I think that's why I loved it so much. Um, and it's it's a really interesting book, Jardine, because, um, and I, I really want you to talk about how you got to this format and style. I, I loved it because it's not a memoir, you know, there's all this quitlet out there and it's not a memoir and it's not fiction um, and it's not a novel. Um, and the short, the, the chapters to me felt more like per, little personal essays with like, but they're kind of like a short story because they're so beautifully told. And then you guys did that all using this beautiful, inclusive we voice, which I just loved because it felt like, like, it felt like I was talking when I was listening, when I was reading the, reading the book. Um, and it's such a unique style for, I've read, I've, I love to read, I've read so much. And um, I think it's one of the most unique presentations um, that I have ever read. How did you guys get to that format and that style? Well, thank you. I'm so glad that it worked um, for you. And it really got discovered as the format and the method by trial and error. So Amanda and I came together, you know, she'd been introduced to me when she was just a few weeks sober. A friend of ours knew that we were both writers who were looking at sobriety and looking at changing our lives in certain ways and introduced us. So we started talking and we both talked about how we could not figure out how to live a sober life. Like I, I was a little bit deeper into it than her at that point, but we had the same priorities. Like we love travel, we love, restaurants, we love um, creativity, we love the luxury of relaxing. Both of us had completely inextricably linked those with drinking. Um, so we knew that we had this conversation that um, combined a lot of the things that we wanted and we decided that we hadn't seen a book that really laid out not in abstract terms, but in concrete, tangible ones, what, what rethinking all those things could look like. And that's what I really wanted. I think that's why memoirs, Quitlet memoirs helped me identify my problems because they were so specific. Like I always reference Sarah Heppel's Blackout because that for me, I actually read it after I got sober, but it was still so affirming, like, right. Cause she just described things like, this moment, that moment, this strange, awkward social thing that happened. Um, and when somebody goes ahead and helps you pin it down, for me, that opens up a little door for growth. So Amanda and I thought, why not try to chart out what we've found is this sort of wilderness of new ideas yeah. in, for us, it was a sober life, but it could also just be a more mindful life or a life that's more rooted um, in the hour and not in social ceremonies, the way we've been taught to think of them, but in new ones that we created. Yeah. Um, and then the we voice just came from feeling like there is solidarity in doing this. And for me, getting sober was so lonely. There were so many years where I was so confused. I was honestly embarrassed by what I was going through, didn't know how to admit it even to myself that I was struggling, that I felt lonely, that things were weird. Um, and Amanda and I have very different lives, but we still feel a solidarity about very much what you're talking about, redefining happiness as stringing together joys. Like, I think that was really the meeting point that, yeah. that created the book. And then we just wanted to make it sort of like a candy jar of ideas. You don't have to read from the first page to the last. It can just be like dipped into and sampled and um, sort of like a talismanic book, like something that you'd put by your bed and yeah, feel inspired by. And that's exactly what I did. It's been by my bed actually since I bought it. I just brought it into my office oh. and I have it for the for today. I've got it right here. But um, oh. yeah, it's been by my bed, and I love that about it too because I've actually said this before. Um, I am I'm a huge fan of gratitude, and it's a part of the coach my coaching practice with women that I work with to help them slow down and get more present and. Um, one of the things on my, you know, we all, not all, but a lot of us, when we stop drinking, we do that list of whys, you know, what are all the reasons why I think I need to keep drinking? And what are the reasons why I think my life might be better without alcohol? And 
my list of whys when I stopped drinking, you know, that was substantial. There was a lot on there as to what I, you know, the reasons why I didn't want to drink anymore, but the, they were all big reasons like, oh, this is going to help me be a better parent. I'm going to, you know, it'll I'll be healthier, you know, that kind of stuff. The little reasons, like all the little reasons why I, I didn't know what they were yet. And I feel like that's a universal experience. I hear that from my clients all the time. They do their list of whys. And I'm like, can you just put some really specific stuff on there? I want you to dig in this week. Like what's one thing that happened this week with you not drinking that you didn't expect, you know, and it's hard in the beginning to find those things, but um, this book to me is like all of those things. And one of the things that for me has been on my list now for a while that I never thought of when I was still drinking is that I get to read every night before bed because I'm not, you know, I'm not falling asleep. I'm putting that in air quotes, you know, at nine o'clock on the couch, I'm, I'm able to make a conscious decision to go to bed early enough to read for a half an hour before I go to bed. And so that I just loved the fact that this was the thing I was reading while I was thinking about how <gasps> awesome it was that I could read before, <laughs> that now, you know, um, but it's, it's such a great, That's great. It's, yeah. I can't even like begin to go into, there's so many little like nuggets in this book. It's just one after another, like you said, it's so great. So I can't even go into all of them, but I do want to just highlight a couple of things so that people can get a sense of what it is works. Cause you and I, I feel like we're speaking the same language, but people are probably listening, thinking, what are they talking about? Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's just a really, really hopeful book in that for somebody who's in that place where I was when I first stopped drinking and where you were obviously for some years, it gives you this, um, it just gives you something concrete to kind of, because I'm always trying to say to women, oh, it's going to get better. It gets easier. It's, it's, it actually gets really amazing, you know, but until you experience for yourself, it's really hard to believe that. And I feel like this book does a great job of in these really bite-sized, like manageable pieces saying like, here's a really concrete example of something that is available to you, you know, in this. Um, and, uh, and that's why I think it's so hopeful for women. But I want to talk about just a couple little things. So I'm a mom. I know Amanda's a mom. Um, and I, I love the fact that you guys had this balance going on where I felt like I knew who you were. I, I almost played this game when I was reading the chapters where I was like, who's this? Because <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you say Jardine and sometimes you say Amanda and sometimes you don't. So I was like, who is this? Who's this? Um, yeah. But I also loved that because it felt like it was those were probably shared experiences a lot of the time. Um, and certainly when you're reading it, it feels like your experience. But so some of the stuff that Amanda, that, that were more like Amanda's story um, really resonated with me as a parent, um, especially the arsenic hour. I absolutely loved that one. I feel like any mom who read that, who drinks would resonate with that. That was a little essay. What do you call them, essays? What do we call them? We call them mini essays. I don't know what they are. So really <laughs> short, just a couple, these are just a couple of pages, guys. They're not that long. They're just these beautiful little like snapshots. And this one was um, the arsenic hour, which is what I used to call the witching hour, which for me was between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. when you're ready to kill your children and you're exhausted and you just come off of work and you're trying to be like a great mom because you only get to see your kids for two hours a day. And, you know, I remember those hours. Um, so well um when i had my past life when i was still a lawyer and i would come home and i'd be you know just exhausted we'd be passing the kids back and forth to each other they'd be crying anyway she just talks about that arsenic hour and how we associate alcohol with it as the way to get through it and the way to cope and the way to you know do it do it better and like i said get through the day um and then just comes up with just at the very end of the essay just this beautiful just this beautiful little basically, I don't know, a little story about um, what's actually available to you and how you can actually go through that and do that without alcohol and, and what's available to you as a parent when alcohol isn't part of that equation. And when I read that, I was like, she just, she just nailed it. That's exactly how I felt when my kids were really little. It's, it's so, it was so moving to me. The other one I loved, which I feel like it was you, <laughs> was business drinks in Malibu. Was that you? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Where you talked about like being in a, you know, a, in a bar with people trying to do some networking or whatever and having to deal with that awkward, 
question of why are you not drinking? Um, and I, I loved it because it was, you know, it was part funny, but it was also re it really it hit home. Um, and it's a question that so many people gra grapple with. How do I explain my decision not to drink? But then at the very end of that chapter, you give that lovely little story of the guy who's the nightclub owner in New York mm -hmm. who partied like nobody's business and dressed like a space cowboy or whatever. And so no one knew he wasn't, he was sober, but you asked him, are you sober at some point? And he said, yeah, I'm sober, sober as a judge. And, um, and his, his answer to, can you remember his exact answer? I'm trying to remember it when you asked him why? Yeah, I mean, he was a fascinating character to me because it took me a long time to figure it out. I just slowly was like, you don't, you're not drinking and you're not, and you're not doing anything. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I mean, I party with y'all all night long, all the time. He's like, you guys are spending all your money and I'm making tons. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> that was one of those little pieces in the puzzle too of like, huh, I do I just sort of like flood away all of my assets all the time. And I started watching sober people and I'm like, you get to do the same things I'm doing without ending up devastated you know, in more ways than one, whether it's financially or otherwise. Yeah, and then you you also asked him why he didn't drink. Like you asked him before that, I think he said, why why don't, why are you sober? And he said, because um, with a twinkle in his eye, I'm happier this way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is just the answer we should all be able to give. <laughs> why can we not just all say that? Why do yeah. we enter into this debate about this all the time? Because the truth is that's my answer now, um, but I don't say it that clearly. I don't even have the confidence now to say it that clearly. I wish I did, but I loved, I loved that chapter too, because anyone who doesn't drink has struggled with that in the business context. It's like the awkwardness of all of that. Um, oh God, that is real. I mean, yeah. and the book really does try to honor the fact that like, there always will be those moments. You know, I got ha hassled in a restaurant right before the pandemic hit by the restaurant owner who was trying to give me a glass of wine and I kept saying I don't drink and then he did that whole thing like why are you even eating then you know food is nothing without wine I'm like oh my god really are you gonna do this <laughs> this whole thing which I've seen a million times but I think I do think our culture is changing a little bit I I dream that it is easier and easier to just say to somebody like because I'm happier yeah, I, I agree. I see it shifting slowly, but I still deal with that awkwardness. We all will. And as you say, I think in, I don't know if you said this, I think you say it in the book, but I've heard you say it on social media. I mean, we, we've all done that. Like we've all been the, on the other side of that, like, you know, saying, oh, come on, just have, have a drink, have fun, you know, relax. So we have empathy for the, for, for, for people who say those things to us. Um, and, um, the other thing that the other piece of the book that I loved was the part, and I know a lot of people love this part, but the What About Rome chapter, where you talk about traveling without alcohol, which was one of my biggest, we love to travel. And it was one of my biggest holding back points on not drinking. And I would, you know, for the first couple of years, like ask myself before vacations, like, might I, might this be the time I start drinking? <laughs> you know, I would kind of like entertain the possibility and, um, that chapter, What About Rome, talks about just like the incredibly, um, just just the, those moments that are not available to you when you're drinking your way through a vacation. And they're just these unexpected pleasures. And I have two little examples of that I can think of that fit into that category for me. One, I'm going on my first all-inclusive vacation with my sister. Uh, we call them our sister moons. And we go away like, you know, a, every couple of years we go away by ourselves for a week or so and um, we went back to a place we had already gone in Mexico and the first time we went we drank our faces off and so we went back to the same place but I was no longer drinking and my sister's mate has been an amazing supporter of mine and just lovely about all of it so I knew it wasn't going to be a problem but I was still thinking like oh this is going to be weird how's this going to go um and what I ended up doing was I became the person who got up at six o'clock and went down to the beach and booked like put the towels on the chairs and got the chairs for us and then I got this really had really good coffee at this resort I got this really great coffee and I would sit down there there'd be no one else on the beach I'd watch the sunrise and I would drink this coffee and it was just the most lovely moment of the day for me and that was something that would not have been available to me if I had been drinking the night before 
And then the yeah. other thing, oh, sorry, go ahead. Completely, yeah. I like, mean, I've had that same. Yeah. Never, right? Like sunrises, never. Um, and then the other little thing I was thinking of when I read that chapter was that I went to um, Tuscany with my, ki my kids and my husband um, when I was sober, which seems like a weird place to go, you know, when you're not drinking. Um, <laughs> but um, we actually had an amazing trip. And I, one of the things I used to do there is I would do, I would walk at night. So as the sun was setting, I would walk, which also wouldn't have been available to me if I was still drinking. And it was, you know, it's Tuscany, it's beautiful. Um, but you would smell like it'd still be hot at the end of the day and you could smell like the dirt, you know, the hot dirt and stuff <laughs> as you're walking and it's just gorgeous. And um, again, nobody out there except me, because, well, where we were, but also because other people are probably drinking. <laughs> and I'm out there walking by myself so oh that's beautiful that thank made me just that. yeah thanks for writing this book Jardine like just thank you for writing this book it's such it's so it was I, I it was so unexpected when I opened it I didn't know what it was about um and I was just so surprised at the what you guys had chosen to focus on I just think it's so beautiful and there's nothing else out there like it I love it thank you you're welcome thank you thanks for connecting with it too yeah. Um, what do you think the key to, you know, we we're talking about the joy, that daily joy kind of idea and just kind of getting more present in your life. What do you think some of the keys are to noticing? Because you're obviously really good at noticing this stuff. Like, how did you get to that place? You said for a while you struggled and you didn't feel all of this. Like, what, how did you transition to, to a place where you were able to write all of these beautiful stories? I think it was really, um, Articulating to myself in a notebook, um, gratitude lists have always, since I discovered them, have always helped because I think I know what I'm grateful for. And then when I'm actually forced to articulate it in a list, I try to do one in the morning, one at night. It's amazing what comes up, you know, and it's amazing what becomes crystallized. Like, oh, I, I would have bypassed that or I would have just, um, it would have just been kind of sublimated and, and, and becoming more and more aware of the little moments. I don't do well in the big abstractions. I really do well by um, realizing like, oh, when I first started dating sober, like um, the person who's now my husband took me out for, the first time and he was sober. So he kind of knew how to do it where I didn't. I only knew how to like right. absolutely go to town with whoever I was meeting. And, you know, we had a really pretty dinner at this little vegetarian Italian place in Austin. Then he took me to a pinball arcade, which at first I was like, oh my God, this is weird and awkward. And I was feeling shy. And by the time we were done with two hours of playing games, I was more exhilarated and alive than if we'd been sitting at a dive bar for two hours. And then he finished the night with like a little soda fountain ice cream float, you know, and getting home and realizing like, those are the things you love. You love feeling like a kid when you were playing a game, you loved getting out of your self-conscious shell um, by way of something that somebody offered to you and introduced to you. You loved being in a big, joyful, loud, crazy place. Um, you loved a little sweet treat at a funny little place at the end of the night and talking to the dude who was serving us our ice cream, like just recognizing the different dynamics. Like it didn't need to be that the guy was serving me whiskey. It's just that I loved a late night interaction with a person who was giving me a little treat, you know? Yeah. Um, Amanda and I often called it like forensic breakdown of these moments like what were you getting out of it like arsenic hour for her I think was so massive because it was revelatory to her to realize she just needed her family to let her be for a minute and it wasn't going to be by downing five glasses of chardonnay while cooking it was by letting her go sit in the hammock for half an hour and maybe they were going to order pizza that night um and that was going to be okay it was them letting her chill and her being able to just let her body and mind relax for a minute. And then we also started to see the other side of these things. Like I, I love what Amanda's journey has taken her to in terms of that moment, lying in the hammock during that crazy arsenic hour, she noticed that her daughter was watching 
And she thought, this is good. My daughter is going to grow up and realize like mothers do not need to be going 24 seven without a break. We're allowed to sit in the hammock in the, in the sunset, you know, for a half an hour. And so it has not just the moment of joy, but it also has these repercussions in the life you build for yourself and around yourself um, and what it does to relationships. I think that was a huge part of it for us too, was figuring that stuff out, figuring it out in notebooks, but then also finding friends that we can have these really long in-depth conversations with. I learned so much from Amanda, you know, us talking about these things taught us how to, how to then identify them in the future, how to execute them, um, how, to, how to live this way. I love that so much. I love so much about what you just said. Um, yeah, and I wanted to talk a bit about your friendship with Amanda, because one of the things that um, so many, well, I, I mean, I struggled with this in the beginning, and I didn't get sober during a pandemic. So I, I felt very, very alone. Um, I didn't, ha I didn't know anybody else who didn't drink. Um, I was kind of, you didn't. Call, no, and I was what you would call like a gray area drinker. So, you know, objectively, probably people would not have thought I had a problem, most people. And so it was weird when I stopped drinking. I mean, I had to stop drinking. It was really costing me a lot, but people didn't really understand that. So I kind of had this you know, I felt like I had to defend it all the time, but I didn't want to make other people feel bad. Like it was just, it was, all, there was all this awkwardness and I felt very alone in it because most of my friends still drink and, you know, did certainly did then. Um, so uh, when I read The Sober Lush, one of the things I was like pining for the friendship that you have with somebody who shares all of like, who understands all of this and who shares all of this with you and thinking, how amazing is that? I mean, I, I will say I do have now lots of sober friends, partly as a result of doing the work that I do and, you know, being a certified coach with this naked mind and all of that. I've met all kinds of great people. But when I first started out, I felt very alone. So what, what, like, how did that, how did that happen? <laughs> so how did you guys get to the point where you thought we're going to write a book together about this? And what role does that friendship and maybe the other, you know, the other friendships that you have and just the community that you've built around sobriety, um, what role does that have in you staying happily alcohol free and with the emphasis on happily instead of, you know, white knuckling your way through it every day? I mean, when I really trace back how Amanda and I connected, it's because it's partly because I finally at a certain point just decided to be more open about being sober. I was very secretive about it. I also could have been thought of as gray area in certain ways. Mm -hmm. I definitely had surrounded myself with a group of people that partying was what we did. It was normal. Um, and I finally decided just to kind of post something on Facebook, like I've been a year sober. And that was the beginning of starting to connect with people that weren't in my immediate circle, but who got in touch. Um, I, I think it's so crazy that we can't, it's, we still live in a society that a lot of people feel like they can't just openly talk about it. Like it couldn't be as simple as, Hey, I'm moving to Joshua Tree. Does anybody know anybody there? Can you tell me where to go? How it can't be as, you know, it doesn't feel as possible to a lot of people that, that we can be so open and ask for resources and ask for connections and references and, yeah. um, so that by being open about that, our other friend knew that I was sober and knew when her friend Amanda said, I'm, I'm really interested in meeting people, she knew to connect her with me. Yeah. Um, so I think it was partly me just kind of coming out into the world and saying, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm playing with, this is what I'm trying out. Uh, I wish I had done that sooner. Um, it is. It does make a person vulnerable, but I found that the rewards of it were much bigger than the, than the vulnerabilities, which is the basic essence of sobriety in general for me. It is very vulnerable making, but the rewards are massive. Yeah, that's a good way to um, And then a lot of my friends now are not sober, but if I originally had a drinking relationship with them, we kind of reformatted things. So now we meet for a little, you know, breakfast or we meet these days for a little backyard coffee, or we just make a Zoom and 
um, date and know that we're going to talk. Or I have a few friends that we do the walk and talk where we both know we're going to take a hike and yeah. um, put our AirPods in and talk. And um, But a lot of my friends, yeah, are not sober. We just um, talk though about life. A lot of my friends now have become partners in collaboration. I do a lot of creative work with friends. That's been massive. That was another part of redefining, like, what do you really want out of a friendship? And for some people, it's, um, I know a lot of friends who bond over parenting and it's so that their kids can be together. They can talk about parenting. For a lot of my friends, we often talk about careers and collaborations and I work with photographers and other screenwriters and we just talk about projects and sometimes work on projects together. Um, I did go to meetings and I was so shy that I wasn't the kind of person that would then collect a ton of new friends from that mm -hmm. but I also wish I'd done that sooner just because you can just meet one person through a Facebook group of people talking about things through a meeting um, and that one person can change everything, you know, yeah. as Amanda did for me, like, you know, it, it can be a door to a new social group. It can be a door to new ideas, et cetera. But it is, it, it's never gotten easier for me. I always feel vulnerable and shy. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's a really common way for women to feel. And um, I think we, we, I just did a podcast episode actually, I don't know when it aired a couple of weeks ago on connection with women. So not in the context of, of alcohol, but just generally our need, just our kind of base need for connection and community. And we were talking about how that naturally, how it becomes, it almost becomes harder to connect the older you get because you're, you have, you establish all these friendships and then they change, people move away, people have kids, people, whatever. And, you know, you start to kind of lose that, that, you know, foundation that you had of friends and then you start looking for new friends and it feels really weird because you haven't done it since you were 20 and, um, you know, and it's, and it's awkward, but I think the way to think of it is like you're dating and it's not all, sometimes it's just like a first date or a second date and it's not going to go anywhere from there, you know, and then other times you have these moments of just incredible for whatever reason it's just meant to be you meet these women and you have this you just form this great connection so i'm so glad you said that because I've, i have many clients if you're listening you know who you are who are resisting you know reaching out and just trying to trying to find those people and it is a bit of a it's a bit of a crapshoot you just have to throw it all out there and then some of it's going to stick and and you find those people like you have obviously found in amanda which is awesome um I love, one of the things I love about this book, Jardine, is the rebellious tone in many of the essays, which I feel like is you. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> it feels like it might be you a lot of the time talking. This is something I hear a lot, and I don't know if you felt this way. Um, maybe in your early days of sobriety, but a lot of my clients will say to me, like, I just want to have a drink because it feels like the fact that I can't have a drink is just, you know, I just want to be a rebel. I want to, this rebellious piece in me just wants to have a drink. And I always say something like, you know, 84% of Americans drink. So how rebellious is it really to drink? Like, isn't it the act, the greatest act of rebellion to like happily not drink? And, you know, maybe you can dig into that and kind of, you know, find your inner rebel in that way, you know, be the one, the, the sheep that doesn't follow the herd and actually does the different thing. But when I, when I read so many of these little um, mini essays in this book, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Cause there's like this little edge of rebellion in there. So I just wondered if you'd ever felt that. And um, if you know what I'm talking yeah. about. I mean, I think what kept me, even though I would do my little experiments with sobriety and be happier, be more creative, be more prolific, I would go back and I think I was so married to this idea of, for me, drugs and alcohol, just partying in general, being how I can say F you to whoever is expecting me to be a way I don't necessarily want to be, to fit in, to do this and that. I, I just, I looked at it as I romanticized it. I really did. Whether I knew it or not, I think for years I didn't fully understand the like gravitational pull of that mythology for me that that's really rebellion and granted I punched a clock you know Monday to Friday it's Friday night um 
that is a way to, to kind of blow things up, but it is to me no longer interesting and also no longer, like you said, deeply rebellious since I'm basically just doing now exactly what society is telling me to do. Um, I, I, I think I also had to dig deeper in what rebellion means and I had to decide what ordinary life means because I love a beautiful intact daily life you know I, I don't need chaos all the time I'm not that kind of person at the same time I don't want it to be so um, repetitive and and predictable that my mind starts shutting down you know definitely as a writer like I like to be surprised I like for the world to explode sometimes. And I usually got to that by, I used to think of it as pressing a nuclear war button by getting wasted. Right. Um, but I think that there are so many ways to do that. So the, the chapters on divine transgressions and consciousness experiments really try to go into like, the sobriety does not need to mean that you tone everything down. It doesn't need, mean that things have to become so ordered that they're um, boring, you know? Right. It, these are like my gravest fears. This is what kept me from sobriety for so long. So we look at things like zero gravity float tanks and lucid dreaming and literally staying up all night sober just to see the sunrise because it flips night and day, like simple ways to keep playing with life so that it feels rebellious and experimental. Like, I, I don't think that that was just me as a teenager. I think that's probably how I'll be till I die, you know? Yeah. Um, but drugs and alcohol were no longer the road there. They were actually leading away from it. Yeah, that's a great way to, that's a great way to describe it. Um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but it feels like you're gonna lose all the spontaneity and just it's mm -hmm. everything's gonna, yeah, just gonna get stuck in a boring, in a boring routine. But I, again, I'll say it one more time. I think this book is the antidote to that. It's the antidote to boring, to being a boring uh, alcohol-free person. And I, I really love the fact that like, I think you know this, I'm, a, I'm trained in um, with Annie Grace through this Naked Mind as a certified coach. And you know, I, I think you're familiar with that book, right? Yes, yeah. I think it's an incredible, incredible yeah. book. And you know, the underpinning of that is like, let's really focus in on what we get from this as opposed to what gets what we give up. So you know, that focus on um, abundance and freedom versus deprivation and, um, you know, just knuckling down with willpower. Yeah. Um, and I really feel like this book, if you have you read this naked mind and you like that part if that spoke to you when you read that and you thought oh this might actually be the key to to actually doing this and being happy um doing it then this book is the perfect complement to that because that's really you know when i when i read it that's kind of what i'm always thinking about i'm like these are all the things that are available to you as a result of not drinking um but as i said i think they're also available to you if you drink so, you know, if you just, if you can just slow down and it's about being present, you know, if you're obviously, if you're numbing and you're numbing yourself to the point where you're not even there because you're drinking so much then you're not going to see and feel these things, but um, you just need to slow down and get present to notice some of this, the stuff that's going on. I think the person that can moderate can absolutely use all the chapters in the book. It is really just about not relying on alcohol to deliver all these things. It shouldn't have to be responsible for delivering all of your creativity, feelings of rebellion, feelings of connection, feelings of relaxation and reward. You know, it's, right. it, if it can, if its role can be minimized and these other things can be amplified, I think that's exactly what the book sets out to do. And I love, I think this naked mind is, Brilliant. We actually thought of this book as, as we discussed it, we thought what doesn't exist, what could be an add on to what has now, I mean, this stuff did not exist 20 years ago. It didn't exist yeah. when I was trying to get sober, but now there is this infrastructure of, of literature about the memoirs of how to identify things, problems, and then 
something like this naked mind is just brilliant in building building a structure for a person to rethink life on. And then what we hope to do is kind of map out the the particulars on this side of yeah of things. Yeah, you did, and you did a great job. It's it's just it's perfect to me. The two books go so well together and. Um, I just have one last question for you because I don't want to keep you any longer than I promised you I would. But I'm just wondering, since this actually comes from one of my favorite clients, she asked me to ask you this question. Um, she was wondering if there has been an experience that you've had since writing The Sober Lush that if you were still writing that book would have made its way in as a new chapter. Oh my gosh, there have been a few. Um as you and I were talking about before the interview, Zoom has, the fact that this is part of our culture now has really opened things up. So I've done, I've gone to, you know, these digital like art curator talks in different countries and um, and actually been part of lectures and talks and groups that I never would have had access to. And again, as a shy person who's always looking for ways of connecting that, is um that has been a huge part of it um i have definitely met more people online by doing things like that i've started gardening which i never really embraced but i actually moved during the pandemic and inherited this garden that um that I think I'm approaching differently now than I would have many years ago. Like I've reached out to the person who helped design the garden years ago, who has a radio show here in Joshua Tree, just to see if he'll talk to me about what his ideas were. Um, I think my mind is way more open to meaningful ways to reach out to people and what I want to connect over. You know, back in the day, I would have moved to a new place and the bar would have been my hub, you know, the restaurants and bars would have been where I met people and where life was kind of headquartered. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking, you know, I can meet this really fascinating guy who's been making desert gardens for years, who has this crazy radio show. And, um, and if you, you know, if we don't end up being best friends, it's fine. Like you said, you just reach out and make yeah. the connections here and there as you can and um, see what comes from it, so. Oh, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the things I say when I'm trying to encourage clients to, to reach out and they're like, where do, I, where do I go? How do I find people? I would say like, think back to when you were, you know, a kid um, mm -hmm. or before alcohol became like a major factor in your life. Like what were the things you did that brought you joy? Go and find those things and you will find people who love those things too. And maybe you'll find, you know, you'll find your people there. I, I love that model. Um, there's a few parts of the book. Like I, I started going to formula one races with my dad and I'm not a gearhead. I'm not a car freak, but I loved being in the midst of all these people that were so wildly passionate about this thing. And this thing wasn't, again, I came from bar restaurant world where the thing is always going to be booze and yeah. To be in this place where everyone was excited by like the different countries being represented and the legacies of the cars and the race itself. And anytime I can put myself in the midst of a bunch of super passionate nerds, <laughs> and if it's not my subject matter, I love it. I just love it. And then if it is reaching out, yeah. um, there's so many, there's so many little micro groups in this world now. And to be able to reach them digitally is, is kind of magical, the magical part of technology. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and, and if you're listening to this and you're in any communities around sobriety and you're looking for, for more intimate connections, one of the things I always suggest is just get in the chat and just say, Hey, I'm looking for, and be really specific. Like I'm looking for women between the ages of 40 and 50 who, you know, haven't been drinking for a while and love desert gardens and <laughs> see, if anyone, see if anyone, you know, responds because you'd be amazed. And the, these groups now online during the pandemic, especially they're massive, you know, some of these communities, which is amazing, but it can feel yeah. overwhelming for people and people feel like it's just too big to actually make any intimate or meaningful connection. But if you reach out in those groups, um, you can often find it there as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, listen, Jardine, this has been delightful. I think I could talk to you for another hour. Um, I Again, thank, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And if people are looking to find out more about you, again, they can follow you. Um, I know you're at The Sober Lash on Instagram. What's the other handle? Jardine LeBear Projects. Perfect. And then you have a website as well, which is? JardineLeBear.com. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Listen, everybody read the sober lush. It's so great. Um, and, um, and let me know what you think about it. Cause I think you're going to love it as much as, as much as I did. Thanks again, Jardine. It's been great talking Thank to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a burnout and alcohol coach, I help busy women like you find freedom from alcohol. If you're ready to start exploring your relationship with alcohol, I've got lots of options for you, including private and group coaching programs. Find out more on my website. Go to www.wendymccallum.com and click on the Freedom from Alcohol tab. That's www.wendymccallum.com. To be sure you don't miss any upcoming bite-sized conversations, subscribe now to this podcast.